my high school graduation. Um, as you can tell, it's um, not in my high school. Well, you don't know my high school. I live in Fairfield. I lived in Fairfield, Connecticut, but this is not my high school. Um, this is a surgical ICU at Columbia Presbyterian, um, where um, you know trauma happened to me all at once, and I woke up in a new place. Um, but eventually, um, I got back to theater uh, at the end um, in a different way, actually sharing my story on stage in my own show. Um, so that's the super, super cliff notes of one of the detours in my life. Um, but the truth is, what story that you've read or that you've watched or that you live through doesn't have a good detour. Um, I mean, um, if you just heard a story about there was this character going through his life and that was his day, it wouldn't be very interesting. So if life didn't go as you expected, that is, um, there you go, a detour. Um, so I'm going to share a bit more. Um, and through this art that you see, um, I never thought I'd get into visual art at all. <laughs> I was always musical theater. Um, but this was uh, one of the flowers on my detour, which I'll um, get to later. Um, but... As I'm going through this, um, think about as you're going through this time or anything, COVID or not, you know, unexpected in your life. Um, think about those flowers that you were forced to find that you would have never seen um, had life not taken a different route. So um, growing up, I was in love with theater and the world of nature. Um, all my trees kind of have this personality to them because for me, trees were my best friends. Like nature walks were like how I do my like after school hangouts. I, I was a nature geek. Um, I just loved them. Um, and, um, and that was my world. And I was, you know, very um, driven in knowing um, these are my values. Um, this is what I stand for and that I'm going to college for musical theater. Um, so um, I'll talk about later how creativity helped me express all this. Um, but um, when trauma hits, um, well, the first thing that happened is I was um, studying professionally with a voice teacher who I really respected and who I became a mentor in my life um, when I was 15. And then when I was 17, um, he started sexually abusing me, which for me, uh, it was a complete shock and I went out of body. I completely dissociated. Um, years later, when I could finally start to process it, I didn't have the words for it. So I expressed it through, I could see that, you know, one side was this and one side was that, or like everything became numb and blurry. Um, and that was how I experienced my world. And so I just walked around in this fog for most of my uh, junior year um, and senior year of high school. Um, finally, I told my mother uh, on my birthday on April 10th, uh, 2005, and we were, she took it very well for a mother um, that cares about her daughter and we we're gonna find therapy and all those things and then Literally two weeks after that, um, I just had a lot of stomach pain that wasn't going away. Um, and so I was rushed to the uh, emergency room. And um, I guess when the surgeons cut into me, my stomach burst to the top of the OR because there was so much internal pressure. There had been a blood clot or a stress ulcer gathering or something like that. Um, and so I basically, I wake up months later in a hospital room, in an ICU, where people are suddenly telling me how much better I look. I'd never been sick my entire life. So waking up with all these tubes and bags on me, I was, the first thing I could think about was, okay, like, I had just put in my college acceptance letters. Aren't I going to college? And then I had to hear the news that you're not going to college 
Ooh, wait, what, what, what's going on? Um, and I'm in the hospital for this just period of time. I, I really felt as a teen, I felt like I was stuck in jail. Like I was yelling at the doctors, like, you can't tell me what to do. Um, and then I was told then, you know, that I didn't have a stomach and I hadn't even thought about eating or drinking, but just when I was becoming alert and getting hungry, they tell me I can't even have an ice cube, I can't eat, um, and they don't know if or when that will be possible. So now I don't even have, I'm, I'm very good with dates, I don't procrastinate, um, but I don't even get a calendar date of when this is gonna be done. <laughs> and then I was discharged from the hospital a month later, um, after um, my headmaster actually surprised me at the ICU with my own little private graduation ceremony, which is not the graduation I expected, but really very sentimental. Um, and um, at home was very difficult because it's one thing when you're in the hospital and you're kind of in your sick nest and okay, you know you can't eat and drink and you can't really do much. But what do you do as like a life-loving teen that still has the energy and passion for the world and wants to be part of it? But I'm hooked up to IVs for nutrition and I'm getting, you know, nutrition from the IVs, but psychological hunger is, you know, you're a person and you want to, food is such a social and, and, person like thing and now I don't even have a guarantee if it will happen what what do I do and so these strategies um these aren't things that I went into this crazy situation with these are things I realized in retrospect um and at first they seem like gratitude creativity hope stories they kind of sound like those corny inspirational phrases you see on like Hallmark cards and stuff. But the truth is, I didn't have any kind of therapy. I didn't know anything about mental health. Um, these were just skills that I realized I actually used as an active way to get me through. And so the cool thing about this is that we're all capable of doing it. So for everyone that thinks, God, how did you make it through that time? You don't know what you're capable of till you're tested, but it also helps to know that these foundational things are actually very hardcore survival skills. Um, not only to survive, but to thrive through any obstacle. And so, you know, take the, I keep bringing up COVID right now because that's, something kind of universally we all share as a detour, although I'm sure many of you have had many different kinds of detours in your life. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this now. Um, so the first one I wanna talk about um, is hope. So 13 surgeries later um, and three years later, um, this was going to be my reconstruction surgery where um, surgeons uh, did a two-part 19-hour surgery to finally uh, connect whatever insides I left to make a little digestive system. And um, this is a painting I did to celebrate that my detour is done and I could finally eat. It had been three years. Um, and actually on my 21st birthday, we scheduled my uh, doctor's appointment and I even brought like a little waffle as my first bite. Um, that worked for a week. Um, and then after a week, my wound exploded and I was air uh from California to Connecticut to Yale Hospital, where for four months I had to stay there. And it was very scary for me to see doctors who I want to put on this pedestal as, you know all the answers, now you figure this out, um, to see doctors that really didn't know what to do. So I was stuck there after having tasted food um, 
for four months not eating again while they try to figure things out. Um, but this was the flower I wanted to bring up because I was angry. And, you know, on a detour, you deserve to feel anger and nervousness and all those icky feelings. Um, you don't need to be positive all the time. You shouldn't be. You should let that out. But I was really mad. Um, and so my mom, because uh, I really, I'm blessed with a really supportive family. My mother, she did her retail therapy and kept going to the lobby gift shop and finding whatever she could do to get my mind off being hungry. Um, and so she got this, these like kid sets of crafts and, you know, canvases. And you know that feeling when you just don't even want to think of being positive, you just want to fold your arm and be like, no, I'm done with this. So every morning the doctors came in, like 4.30 a.m., poked you, woke you up for rounds. Um, and I remember one mor morning I woke up at like 4 a.m. before they were coming in and I was trembling. I was so frustrated that how did everything just get to this point? Um, that I took, I finally took one of those paintbrushes out and all that anger and fear and everything that I was holding in and stifling and trying to numb out to, I just thought to myself, whatever I'm feeling, I can't control any of this. I'm just going to put it into this paintbrush. I had never picked up a paintbrush in my life before. Um, but I guess that physical energy and that emotion um, caused me to paint this brown wavy line. And before I knew it, I was painting those trees that I missed. And it was such a feeling of release that I could be in a safe container with that anger, but it wasn't consuming me. And eventually I, I just felt this um, this kind of uh, this release, um, and the first painting I created was somewhere up here. Oh, here it is. Um, it's so funny that um, can everyone see this? I hope so. Um, singing tree. Um, whenever people see this painting, this is just a print of it. They see this happy tree just like dancing and singing, but it was created out of such tears and such anger. And for me, that represents the transformative power of any kind of art or creativity that we can create it at such a time of whether it's journaling or anything, such a time of ickiness and bad feelings. And then years passed and we just have the painting to look at um, and that memory of, um, oh, remember when I got through this. And so um, after that, for the rest of the four months I was stuck there, art was just this release that I couldn't control what the doctors were feeling, but I felt like I had some control over, over who I was and, and manage uh, what I was feeling. So I would paint day after day, and every day I would leave a painting um, outside my hospital room. My nurses would actually wheel some of their patients on, on the wheelchairs by my room to see what I had created each day. And by the end of Yale, I created 70 paintings. Um, and I felt like I was more than a medical patient. I was a person. Um, so I, I want to talk about this idea of creating hope, um, especially now. Um, I know, you know, recently many of us have experienced this new surge of hope. Um, like there is, uh, somewhere beyond us and somewhere, um, we can go. And what I learned is that, um, hope is not like baseless, you know, wishful thinking. Hope is an active, it's an act. It's an active ritual. It's something that we have to create. Um, and it's the fuel that gets us from 
corner to corner on our detour. So one of the biggest examples of hope for me of what is something I can actively do to create hope is when I first got home from the hospital and I had no timeline of when I could eat or drink, I just got out this big flip chart and I would write seven days so I can eat again, six days, five days. And then when it got down to zero, I just flip it over again and start from the beginning. And I would make those countdowns because it's almost like um, an athlete visualizing the finish line. Um, just seeing that day and visualizing it for myself was my way of creating hope. Um, because again, hope is not just a wish. It, it's something we can create as individuals and, and as a community together. Um, so I also want you to think about, you know, for this time, how, what is a way that you can create hope that, you know, that can get you through the days that are more hopeful and not so hopeful? And also, um, what is a ritual or a way of practicing active hope that you can share as a community where you can all uh, share your thoughts of, um, you know, getting through the next steps? Um, so, you know, hope is not just this beam of light that comes from you on a mountaintop. You, it's something you got to create yourself. Um, believe it or not, for all the crazy things that I did, it turned into seven years I couldn't eat or drink total. I got into cooking. Um, and apparently, according to my family, I made great meals. Um, but for me, it was an active way of you know, using all my senses to um, almost like a like like a ritual that as I'm creating this, I'm also manifesting in here that I will be able to um, to eat and drink this. And um, spoiler alert: here's my bag of cheese. So it does something. I, I'm so creativity. That that is the in no particular order. Uh, the other skill to um, resilience for me. Um, I explained it a little bit, um, how I first discovered um, visual art. But I got to say, you do not have to be an artist um, to be creative. Creativity is really, it's just a mindset. Um, it's a way to think in a new way. Um, and creativity for me is that emotion I'm feeling, how can I express that in some kind of way that involves my body where I can really express it in a way where I'm not overthinking everything. And when I say through your body, it can be laughter, it can be breath. You know, it's um, it's any way we can release it. Um, I, as a survivor of sexual assault, um, especially during, you know, the Me Too movement, I got asked a lot, you know, what is the typical amount of years for barriers to reporting? Um, why don't people talk about it? Um, just that alone, um, for me, it took 10 years before I could even talk about being sexually abused. Um, I had to process it for myself. And I didn't have words. Again, I didn't know anything about mental health or PTSD or anything. Um, so I just saw all the trauma that happened to me. You know, as the medical things too, as more of like flashes of images and light and sound and things like that that I couldn't, you know, articulate in a statement or even say the words of what had happened to me. So that's where. I would say art really rescued me um, because especially once I could eat, eating is really how I started really feeling again and thinking. So all of a sudden I was getting flooded with all of these memories that I hadn't had before. You know, it kind of woke me up internally as well. So now I was getting flashbacks of the sexual abuse and memories of the hospital all together at once, which was so overwhelming that, 
the best way I could express it was through all these spheres of paint. And I guess basically that's what creativity is. It's a way to get things out of us and put things together that aren't coherent and don't have to make sense, but it, it does something for us. Um, it's a great, I call it container because we all need a healthy container to express our emotions. Um, and when we don't, we can uh, run away from them. We can numb them out through social media or drugs or maladaptive coping mechanisms. But um, creativity is really a way we can harness those feelings that maybe don't feel so pleasant and use them in a positive way. Um, this is a picture of me with the singing tree painting, um, which now even I look at as just a happy painting. Um, so that's uh, my singing tree thing. So I talked about energy. We all have energy. Um, there are thinking forms of energy. Um, I know during this time, a lot of my energy I find is being sucked into a screen where I have to step back and take a breath and be like, okay, I am, I am a body too. I'm not just a thinking screen. Um, and we have to make sure that, you know, for anyone that knows the law of conservation of energy, you can't get rid of energy. So if we think we want to get rid of a sad feeling or an angry feeling and just um, someone tells us to have a positive attitude or put on a happy face or just remember what you're grateful for, sometimes you can't do that. You just remember that everything you're feeling now is completely okay or that you may be feeling if you're wondering like why did this have to happen like right now or um i'm mad that this happened or i'm really anxious about this that's how you feel i uh, you can't get rid of it uh so what do you do with it you treat it as energy just like everything else and um that's why creativity is it's such a great use of energy. Um, I call uh, well my five little superhero allies are my superhero five senses um, because um, the best way to really get in touch with that energy is quick, right now, um, do this. You can all see the screen. What's the very first thing right now? You smell. Ah, you can read the rest. Take a minute. But not too long, because I got to get through this. I want to. But I would imagine these as superheroes when I got really anxious, flying in with their superhero five senses, uh, superhero five senses capes and being like, I hereby grant you the power of now. And that would put me right here in this moment where I realized like in this small, if I can place myself on like the tiny pinhead of this moment, there's nothing really to be anxious about. Cause the anxious is only when I'm thinking about it or dwelling on something, but right here, um, I can smell like fresh air. I can see light. Um, I can hear whatever you may hear a bird calling, but it helps sometimes, you know, when you're, you know, going from place to place, or even if you're stuck at your computer for a long time, uh, just ground yourself and Imagine those five superheroes, however you want to imagine them, um, like a Marvel uh, comic book or something, and let them grant you the power of now just for that one moment. And just do that for a few moments at a time. It doesn't have to be all the time. You can get anxious sometimes still, but uh, those can break up those, uh, those times because you don't have to drown in it and you don't deserve to. Um, so you'll see you know, some of my art. Um, these were just um, my ways of just expressing how I was feeling at 
you know, various moments of my detour. Um, so this, I really, let me check the time. I could talk forever, but I don't want to because everyone has to go to bed one day. Um, what are felt sensations? So one thing that we can do that can completely uh, override our ability to be present is uh, we can be feeling something and we can automatically say, oh my God, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I'm stressed. Um, but what if we just, before we even got to that mentally labeling things, what if we grounded ourselves with our superhero five senses and thought about what does that emotion actually feel like on us? Um, so look at this chari. I keep pointing to the screen as if you can see my finger, but I forgot I'm digitally connected to you all. Um, so um, find, look at any of these um, sensations and maybe um, I can't see the chat now because I'm screen sharing, but if anyone wants to type into the chat, um, any, um, any of these they might be feeling in their left wrist, or I'm, I'm just naming a part of me, but um, whatever uh, feels uh, right to you. What do I feel? Okay, well, the top of my left wrist feels, it feels, it feels warm. And that's a pleasant sensation. So that's just one example, but you'll see, um, and I can, I have a lot of handouts that I was going to email uh, Shani that she can um, send to anyone who wants it. But, um, if we stop labeling emotions and just start with how that, say I'm really nervous, maybe this feels more like a burning or twitching. What if I just stopped right there rather than immediately calling it, oh my God, I'm feeling really nervous. And so twitchy, what if I just took that physical feeling? I'm like, well, what else can I do with that twitchy feeling? What does it want to do? Maybe it just wants to shake like this for a bit. Maybe it wants to shake like this so much that it wants to uh, pick up a paintbrush or it wants to uh, do some hand shadow puppetry work to express it. Um, I got this from um, Peter Levine, um, a wonderful book uh, he wrote called Waking the Tiger, which really opened my eyes to um, he started this thing called somatic experiencing, which is experiencing things uh, through our body first. And if you go to his website, uh, you'll see, I mean, there's this awesome video of this polar bear who's been, um, who's been tranquilized actually, but as he's discharging this energy after that, you just see him doing this shaking and shaking and shaking until finally that's released. And when he finally releases that, he restores his, this homeostasis in his body and he's back to normal. So sometimes that nervousness or that anxiety or whatever, this numbness, we just have to experience that feeling and let it just discharge completely. And then we can return to our normal state. Um, how Peter Levine um, noticed this first is he was looking at animals in the wild and he was like, okay, this gazelle is getting uh, herded or hunted by this tiger or something. I'm totally misrepresenting this, but something like that. Um, and so the tiger pounces on him and the gazelle will freeze. It will drop and play dead. But then when the threat is gone, the gazelle will just keep jumping and jumping and jumping and leaping off until all that energy is discharged and it returns to its normal state. Um, and so it's like how I said when I was sexually abused, I, 
I felt very numb and I went out of body. Um, sometimes when we're numb, we just have to get in touch with that energy again and find a positive way we can release that energy until we can fully like be ourselves again. So, so get that energy out creatively and creatively it could be um, through a sport that you like now that I know that your team mascot is Odin, which is kind of cool. Um, it could be um, laughter, it could be the violin, it could be creativity is anything under the sun or not under the sun. Um, so again, this is more on anxiety. Um, but when we figure out how to use that energy, that is also the fuel that propels us on a detour. So don't use those ner nervous feelings to stall you. Use that as like kind of a telescope to look for all those flowers that, that you found um, just because of this uh, unexpected path. 